VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell and Mario Ritter Jr. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Main streets were less crowded Monday as Jakarta began two weeks of social restrictions to slow a rise of coronavirus cases. The rising number has pushed critical care hospital services in Indonesia's capital to unsafe levels. Police officers took steps to punish bicycle riders who did not wear face masks in public. But businesses did not seem to know what to do under the new restrictions. And workers said supporting the health care system should be the top goal. The governor of Jakarta, Anis Baswedan, announced Sunday that the restrictions were to last from Monday until September 27th. He said the move was part of an emergency decision to control a rapid expansion in coronavirus cases in the city. Under the order, social, economic, religious, cultural, and school activities are to be restricted. The order identifies food services, banking, and nine other industries as essential. They are permitted to operate, but under special health safety measures and with half the usual number of workers. Schools, public recreation areas, and wedding party venues must stay closed until the restrictions are lifted. Restaurants and eateries are limited to takeaway and delivery service. Shopping centers must limit the number of visitors and their hours. Only religious centers in residential areas are permitted to open. Jakarta's government had ordered large-scale social restrictions from April to June, then slowly eased the restrictions with businesses reopening and obeying health safety protocols. But the virus has spread to many areas since June, and medical centers are filling with sick patients. Seven of 67 COVID-19 referral hospitals in Jakarta are 100% occupied, while 46 are more than 60% full. Indonesia's Coronavirus Task Force reports that more than 54,000 of the nation's 218,000 cases of COVID-19 are in Jakarta. The nation has over 8,800 deaths from the disease. About 15% of those patients lived in Jakarta. A task force spokesperson said Jakarta has had the most COVID infections nationwide over the past five weeks. We should do these restrictions earlier so we can control the positive case numbers and the death rate, the spokesperson said. A new study suggests that streaming services can lead to higher levels of greenhouse gas emissions. 
Researchers say the results depended, in part, on which technology was being used to send data. The German government provided money for the study. Germany's Federal Environment Agency published a report on the findings. Many studies have linked greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, to rising temperatures in Earth's atmosphere. Greenhouse gases are a product of pollution from factories and other human activities. Streaming services send videos, games, music, and other material over the Internet so that people can watch or listen to it immediately. The researchers estimated the amount of carbon dioxide produced by data centers where material is stored for streaming. It also looked at the technology used to get the data to consumers. The report found that streaming video over fiber optic cables results in the lowest amount of carbon dioxide, or CO2, emissions, 2 grams per hour. Copper cables produced twice that amount. 3G mobile technology resulted in 90 grams of CO2 emissions per hour. The report said streaming over 5G, another wireless technology, would result in carbon dioxide emissions of 5 grams per hour. Data centers were responsible for only a small amount of the energy used. But there were differences depending on how servers were used and cooled, the report noted. Christian Stoll, an energy expert, was not involved in the study. He said the report's carbon dioxide estimates seemed reasonable. But he noted that the study did not consider how much electricity was taken by devices that were used to watch videos. Stoll noted that such devices represent a significant part of the total emissions. Presenting the report, German Environment Minister Svenja Schultz said the study tried to give data to decision-makers at a time when digital issues are important. Schultz suggested that it might be a good idea to set up more public Wi-Fi hotspots, as this is more climate-friendly than streaming in mobile networks. I'm John Russell. A new public opinion study finds that the coronavirus health crisis has affected the mental health of young Americans under age 35. The study found that 56% of Americans, 18 through 34, said they felt isolated in the past month. That compares to 40% of older Americans. The research group NORC at the University of Chicago carried out the study. It questioned more than 2,000 people, age 18 and older, across the United States. Younger adults are dealing with major life issues, including starting college and finding jobs. However, the pandemic has kept them from social activities that are especially important for unmarried people and those starting families. Many younger people are beginning their adult lives during an economic recession. Those in their 30s are experiencing their second. Cristina Torres is a 32-year-old school teacher in Honolulu, Hawaii. The health crisis forced her to postpone her marriage ceremony, which had been set for June. The pandemic also stopped her from attending a funeral for her grandmother. 
and Torres misses her friends and exercising at the gym. It's hard not to feel hopeless sometimes, especially because the numbers keep going up, she said. The NORC study found that younger Americans show higher rates of psychosomatic problems. These include trouble sleeping and headaches. The likelihood of experiencing these problems decreases with age. Tom Smith directs NORC's General Social Survey. He said one possible reason for the difference between young and old is that young adults have less experience dealing with public health crises. Smith, who is 71 years old, said he grew up with the health crisis of polio. Torres thinks some of the difficulty for her generation comes from a lack of historical understanding shared by their parents' generation. She worries about the future. It doesn't feel like it's going to get better, she said. Twenty-five percent of young adults in the study described their mental health as fair or poor. Thirteen percent of those thirty-five and older described themselves this way. Wayne Evans is eighteen years old. He is in his first year of studies at North Carolina State University. But he was sent home because there were a lot of coronavirus cases at the school. He said social media reminds him every day of the threat of COVID-19. In some ways, social media has added to my stressors, yes, he said. The NORC study found 67% of young adults felt at least sometimes that they could not control the important things in life. That is compared to 50% of those 35 and older. An even larger difference existed between young and old who felt that they could not overcome the increasing problems they faced. Fifty-five percent of younger Americans said difficulties were growing too high, while only thirty-three percent of older Americans said the same. Evans blamed social media as part of the problem. Just the information overload that's unavoidable on social media platforms can be distracting, he said. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. From VOA Learning English, Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time, we talked about the presidential election of 1804. Thomas Jefferson, the nation's third president, was easily re-elected. Jefferson was head of the Democratic Republican Party, known today as the Democratic Party. Thomas Jefferson had a very good record during his first term as president. He ended many taxes, he paid government debts, and he gained possession of the huge Louisiana Territory from France without going to war. His political opponents were the Federalists. 
The Federalists were sure Jefferson would win the election of 1804. Still, they were surprised by the strength of his victory. Jefferson won 162 electoral votes. His Federalist opponent won just 14. In the early 1800s, Britain and France were at war with each other. The United States remained neutral. Historian Andrew O'Shaughnessy says, President Jefferson did not want to become involved in a war. He was sufficiently pro-French that he didn't want to ally with the British, but not so pro-French that he wanted a war with the uh, British. Jefferson also believed getting involved in a European war would destroy all the progress he had made at home. His economic policies had helped to pay much of America's national debt, and he was able to reduce taxes. But staying neutral was not easy. The United States was having trouble with Britain. For many years, Britain had been taking men by force to serve in its navy. Britain claimed the right to seize any British citizen anywhere. The custom was called impressment. Conditions in the Royal Navy were not good at that time, and many sailors deserted. Some went to work on American ships. The American ships were stopped and searched in British waters. Anyone born in Britain was seized. Historian Andrew O'Shaughnessy says sometimes American citizens were also taken. There was also still something of an imperial attitude in Britain towards America. You know, they were still insisting that some American citizens had been born British. Uh, it was often difficult for them to uh, be able to distinguish between their own subjects and Americans. Several thousand sailors were taken off American ships during the early 1800s. In 1807, an incident made relations between Britain and America even more tense. Britain believed that four of its sailors had deserted and fled to an American ship called the Chesapeake. The United States said the men were American citizens who had been forced to serve in the British Navy. The United States refused to return them. When the Chesapeake sailed out of American waters, the British ship Leopard tried to stop and search it. The American captain would not stop. First, the British ship fired two warning shots. Then it fired all its guns directly at the Chesapeake. The American ship could do little to defend itself. The captain surrendered. News of the British attack spread quickly. President Jefferson ordered all British Navy ships in American waters to leave at once. He told people not to aid the British. He said any person, American or British, who disobeyed his orders would be arrested. In response, the British government announced a new rule. It said any American ship sailing to Europe must stop first in Britain to get permission. Ships violating the rule would be seized. Relations between the two countries were reaching the breaking point. Impressment was just one of the major problems the United States was having with Britain in the early 1800s. Another problem was trade. Britain wanted to stop the United States from trading with France and its colonies. British warships blocked the port of New York all through 1805. 
no American ship could leave without being searched. Any ship found to be carrying goods for France was taken north to Halifax, Nova Scotia. There, a British court had the power to seize the goods and force the ship's owners to pay a large fine. In the closing days of 1807, President Thomas Jefferson signed a bill banning all trade with Europe. No ships could enter or leave the United States. Jefferson did not believe that trade embargoes were the best way to settle America's problems with other nations. But at the time, he thought an embargo was the only way to deal with Britain and France short of war, and he did not want war. Jefferson later explained why he thought the embargo was the best choice of action. He said, if American ships had sailed out of American waters, they would have been seized by Britain or France. That would have forced the United States into war. Jefferson said it was far better to stop all contact with these nations until they returned to some sense of justice. Jefferson acted to protect American traders, ship owners, and sailors. Yet those were the people who protested the loudest against the ban. They were willing to take the chance of having Britain or France seize their ships and goods. They could not make any money without trade. The situation quickly turned into a political battle between the Jeffersonian Republicans and the opposition Federalists. Federalist newspapers attacked Jefferson. They called him a tool of France and its leader. They charged that Jefferson supported the trade ban to help Napoleon Bonaparte. One Federalist senator wrote a pamphlet against the embargo. He urged Northeastern states to refuse to enforce it. Then he went even further. He met secretly with a British official who was sent to Washington to discuss the situation. He told the British official that Jefferson would be forced out of office because of the embargo. Jefferson simply wished to give the trade embargo a fair chance. He considered the embargo less evil than war. But after a time, he thought, this will not be so. If the war should continue in Europe, and if Britain and France continue to act against us, then it would be for Congress to say if war would not be better than the embargo. Jefferson hoped that the loss of American trade would force Britain and France to change their policies toward the United States. And he hoped the change would come quickly. He knew that the American people would not accept a long ban on trade. A British traveler visiting New York City described what the embargo had done. The port is full of ships, but all of them are closed. Only a few sailors can be seen. Many of the counting houses are closed. The coffee houses are almost empty. The streets near the water are almost deserted. Grass has begun to grow upon the docks. America's northern industrial states felt the loss of trade most deeply. But the agricultural south also was affected. Rich southern farmers and planters suddenly found themselves poor. Tobacco was one of their major crops, and Britain bought more American tobacco than any other country. Because of the embargo, 
the price of tobacco fell so low that it had almost no value. The price of wheat fell from $2 a bushel to seven cents a bushel. Good farmland dropped in value until it was worth almost nothing. Opposition to the embargo was growing. The opposition was strongest in the Northeast. Ship owners and traders believed that the embargo was wrong. They continued to export goods secretly. Some traders began sending goods over land to Canada. From there, the goods were sent on to Britain. Congress passed a law against this kind of trade, but the shipments did not stop. Too many people were willing to violate the law for the large amounts of money they could make by trading secretly with Britain. By August 1808, Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin had lost all hope that the embargo would be successful. Gallatin told President Jefferson that the embargo was defeated by open violations. Another of Jefferson's supporters gave the president some advice. If the embargo could be enforced, and if the people would accept it, then I am sure it would be the wisest course. But if it cannot be enforced completely, and if the people will not accept it, then it will not serve its purpose and should not be continued. Jefferson, however, was not ready to give up his plan. In his last State of the Union message to Congress, he painted a bright picture of the nation. He reported that American industry was making progress. Many goods that had been imported before the embargo were now being made at home. He said almost all of the national debt had been paid, and he said more than 100 gunboats had been built, enough, he declared, to defend the country. Jefferson said nothing about opposition to the embargo, nor did he talk about the serious economic problems caused by it. He said only that Britain and France still refused to honor American neutrality, and so the embargo must continue. The rest of the nation was not so sure. Congress began debating a number of proposals to either lift or amend the embargo. In the first months of 1809, Congress finally approved a bill. The bill lifted the ban on trade with all European countries except Britain and France. Jefferson had hoped to continue the embargo a little longer and with more powers to enforce it. He was not satisfied with the final bill, but he signed it anyway on March 1st. Three days later, the 15-month-old embargo was dead, and the United States had a new president. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.